Boa tarde. Good afternoon. I'm so glad you're here. Virgílio, it's not because of me, it's because of Virgílio, I understand. Okay. So, we are getting this discussion table ready now, and it's an honor for us to uh, be opening up this discussion. Martin. Okay, everyone, you can come up front. I'm calling you all up here. Rogério, please, please come up here, okay? It's like in school. All right, let's respect our time and those who are here and were punctual. Thank you so much. So this is the first partnership that we are so proud to register at Green Rio with Fundação Dom Cabral. I really want to thank my dear Viviani. She is a childhood friend of mine, as well as Shayla. They are childhood friends. And uh, Aspasia as well, all old friends of mine. And uh, because of this discussion table, Aspasia, I think we will see spin-offs for new seminars that will come from these ideas about the Global South. And you know, this is a wonderful discussion table that we have here. I am just impressed with the quality of the gentlemen who are seated here. Having said that, I uh, will take on my role as moderator here. And I am sure that you will agree with me that this is a really incredible discussion table we have here. Alô, ah, nossa mãe. Então, <laughs> eu queria chamar. Okay, so to open up this discussion table, I want to call up Professor Paulo Vicente Alves, Professor of Fundação Dom Cabral, and it's a real privilege to have him here. And if she is saying, if Viviane is saying this, I agree with her. So please, Professor Paulo Vicente. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I have 15 minutes to speak very quickly. I'm going to show you a little bit about how I see this scenario, this new world, how things are happening. And there's always a good side and a bad side to everything. So here we have the ESG paradox. Okay, because the E is against the S and the G is not the solution. The T, the solution is the T for technology. I'm going to show you why this is a paradox. So humanity has three big objectives that are contradictory. So we want to continue having children. We want to eradicate poverty and we want to preserve the environment, right? It's all very beautiful, but these are contradictions. If the population continues growing, I will not be able to preserve the environment. If I want to preserve the environment and I still want to have children, I won't be able to eradicate poverty. And if I want to eradicate poverty and preserve the environment, I cannot continue having kids. So basically, uh, these contradict themselves. We are reaching the limits of the Earth. We have 8 billion people around the Earth today. And according to some authors, we have already surpassed the Earth's capacity. So can technology help us increase this capacity so that we can continue moving forward? Now, to give you an idea of the complexity of this, here we have some numbers. We are 8 billion people today, so the level of consumption today is a 
eight times one of resources. Okay, so we're speaking about abstract measurements that have to do with water, energy, etc. In the future, we will reach eight billion people. This is the projection for the population at the end of the 21st century, and we want to eradicate poverty. So we need. Here we're at five times the level of consumption uh, for 2022. That's the level of Switzerland. So seven times more water, seven times more food, seven times more energy, and seven times more minerals. Now, these are different ways to make calculations. OK, if we oh, no, it's only 10 billion people. OK, we can calculate this in another way. But basically, it's very complex. And we need a lot of technology to be able to resolve the E and the S issues at the same time. So we need technology for this. And uh, well, it's basically follow the money, right? So here we have different departments that receive money, the Department of Defense of the United States of America. And here I have three blocks on my slide. Here we have different budgets, 80 billion here per year for this reference, dollars. And we can see the projection over five years. And in the American Congress here, we have the Innovation Act with its very considerate budget. And this is basically incentives for and what is for this to bring back manufacturing there was offshoring in the 70s and 80s and now they want to conduct a reshoring in 2010 2020 2030 so for this we need the green block reduce the costs of energy and materials and one third in the red block here i need labor force and I need to work on the digital transformation. In the blue block, we are going to increase the longevity of intellectual property here with human enhancement technologies. All right, three times three times three. So these are 10 times greater salaries than those of India. And that is the American strategy that will define the tech revolution that is coming up to resolve this paradox. Now, we have a problem with this onshoring, which is the fact that we have China here in the equation. And uh, we know about this as well, being from Brazil, we're looking at how expensive it is. And uh, we have three cases. We have, of course, cheap labor, or we have qualified more expensive labor. So we have the Chinese case. We have these cases in capitalism. Countries seek out cheap work, or you elevate the cost of labor. And these trends happen. We have seen them in Brazil, in Japan, in China. And we are now seeing this in different countries. Those who want cheap labor today are going to Vietnam and Malaysia, especially, but also Th Thailand, the Philippines, and, and Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, all of these cheaper places in terms of labor than China. Actually, even Brazil can be cheaper than China in terms of labor. But it depends on the case. Sometimes Brazil can be more expensive, but if you only look at labor, it's cheaper. Now, if you want low risk, you want to leave Asia and look for low risk, this was underestimated for many years because people thought we would have no more wars. But now we can see that, yes, wars are part of the process of human development. People can no longer ignore high risk. And now we are looking for different value chains that are called near shore, which is an offshore that is close. So for the US, it's Latin America. For Europe, it was Eastern Europe. Now only the south of Europe. And I'm going to show that in a few slides. And then we have qualified labor. You got to pay expensive for that. You got to go back to the US, Canada, or Europe. And you have different cases as well that go beyond the price of labor. And basically, we have some decades coming up that are very favorable to the Americas. So cheaper workforce here is in Latin America. If you want qualified workforce, you look at the US and Canada. And uh, we're looking at the rest of Latin America as well. So we have, we can reinvent ourselves in these next decades. We had some lost decades, and 
now we can reinvent ourselves. So here I have a graph to show you near shore and the Latin American perspective and then Eastern Europe here with uh, different countries. So considering the US, Mexico is the most relevant. They are the biggest trade partner of the US. They surpassed China recently and now China is behind there. The and uh, they have their own paradigm. And then, of course, we have countries from Central America, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Panama, and Costa Rica as well. We're watching what's happening there because now they are more on the left with their politics. And Brazil, of course, is an option because the size of it is significant because the Republican, uh, the Dominican Republic is a very small country, right? So you need, for example, so you need to look at Brazil as a part of this solution. You have Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Now their politics are more to the right. And of course, this has an impact. And then we have Peru, Ecuador, the Andes. I did not put Bolivia and Venezuela in here because they have their own characteristics. Now. Eastern Europe has a new panorama because of the war in the U Ukraine, Poland, uh, Slovenia, Romania, Bulgaria, etc. Now they're all affected because of the war in the Ukraine. And the focus now is the south of Europe, parts of Europe, parts of Italy, the north of Africa, Spain, Portugal. So we're speaking about south of Europe here. Uh, as this concept because we have the north of Europe as the north of Africa as well that could greatly benefit it over the next few years now looking at this diagram that I have been using for a long time in my classes here we have potential versus military risk some people say oh there's no wars going on you know everyone's hugging it's not going to happen well we know things don't happen this way there are dictatorships for example that want to impose their wills and wars are part of the human process so we have here the BRICS, turkey indonesia mexico these are the big seven emerging markets and then we have many other smaller emerging markets as well so russia of course is here in high risk highest risk in this war that will probably take a long time and we are looking at a civil war possibility in russia now and I see that unfortunately Russia will probably be fragmenting itself. Then we have Turkey. They have been in war for 10 years because of the Syrian situation. China is not involved in wars, but they are saying they are going to resolve the Taiwan issue, quote unquote. And we are seeing this threat of war for China, which is a problem for Brazil because Brazil depends greatly on China. And when this war happens, we will not be able to export or import anything. And the Brazilian economy will enter a crisis, which obviously is something that will happen over the next 16 years. When China goes to war, then Indonesia comes in because all of the commercial routes to China pass through Indonesia. So if we don't want this risk, you have India, Mexico, Brazil. India has some risks because of China, Pakistan, its own internal problems. And uh, of course, its price is one tenth of that of the US in terms of labor. Mexico has the issue of the cartels, but it's by the United States. So the US accepts this risk. If you don't want that, you go to Brazil. So this is my sales pitch for Brazil. You know, Brazil is here and it's here for the long term. Of course, we have our own issues, but Brazil is present and it will be part of this story in the long term. Now, what am I speaking about this? I'm speaking about a possibility of a new Cold War. We have the West on one side, quote unquote, OK, because some countries here are not in the West, uh, Ukraine, Taiwan. Um, and then we have the dictatorships, Russia, China, Iran, and we have this composition, let's say, of this new Cold War, like it or not. Then we have a pro-West group with a more closed mentality, Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, and those who are kind of like on the edge, which are India, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia. I think that should be Brazil's position, not choosing a side. 
because we can see the history of wars, the Second World War. War is horrible, so, you know, we're going to be pragmatic about this. We're not going to take a side. And this is bringing to a new discussion that's Global South. I bet here the definition of Global South, according to UNESCO, that's the, the source is the World Economic Forum. It's not south in the geographic sense. It doesn't go through the equator. But the countries, the south of the most developed countries, the, the Russia is not considered Global South. This is interesting in this story. Um, and the new BRICS, that's also the derived from the story to understand a bit of what is happening. There's five new members of BRICS in the uh, Middle East, basically due to oil. And one of the interpretations of what is happening in the world alongside the new, uh, new Cold War, Cold War have new uh, colonial race, because in the 16th century, 19th century, now the 21st century, that's this third race, but this time it's not led by the Europeans but the Asians, the Asian hunger, China, India, 5 billion people who live in Asia is going to force itself into the world. So these five countries are set to spend their energy to China and India. And I'm showing here the export for Saudi Arabia, Iran, China, the United States no longer relevant in this story who relies on the Middle the, the Middle East is China. If there's a war there, the United States doesn't care. It won't interfere. But it's different from 91, 2003, who has to get involved to stabilize the situation. It would be China. So is China prepared for that? No, a new war in the Middle East is a big risk for China, not for the United States. The United States will have to sell gas. OK, great, oil is expensive. They'll have gas to sell here the food route Brazil and Argentina going through Cape uh, where it's controlled by South Africa and the other three members of BRICS to supply food and the other group to supply en energy and this new uh, global demand and Asia has five billion people out of the eight billion that lives in the world and the rest has three so in America entire America South Central North America just one billion so it's a very empty a demographic emptiness as in comparison to the other regions so it's a very um, imbalanced world either we like it or not and this imbalance causes problems so that's what I had to say just now I'm going to yield the floor to the colleagues and then we go get to the questions thank you Hey, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you're you're correct. Paulo uh, was amazing here. Thank you so much. I was. Um, it's great. Great that this is recorded. We'll be able to watch it again, and um, and learn more. Thank you so much. You know, it's kind of scary. I was a bit tense. I must admit. And is Ingo going to make me more tense with the scenario he's going to present? I have. I'm very glad to pr to present my friend Ingo Blogger. He's the president of Sao. He's a member of several boards. I just said my friend, just to give a, a friendly touch. And this is my biggest privilege. Thank you so much, Bia. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Paulo. In just a few seconds, he gave us a very impactful scenario. I'd like to add to this scenario a few thoughts um, and a reflection over the situation we're in and in which Latin America is positioned, especially South America and Brazil. To start, uh, Paulo started with this uh, strong sense that we have a global pressure in which if we, the 8 billion people, all of them, all of us have this European lifestyle. We would, we need three planets, and we don't have that. If we want a, a general style, general American lifestyle, we need five planets. We would get in 2050, as he said, maybe 10 to 11 billion people, and this is an S curve. It would decrease from 11 to 12 billion. It's a 
giga, giga trend. It started in 1830. Even before that, people had just one billion people, for all we know. And what caused this enormous growth? Two other giga ten trends. One is knowledge. Knowledge is exponential, excessive, and then the second giga trend was access to energies several sources of energy and certainly uh, fossil f uh, energies gave the biggest impulse for these trends and all of the trends are derived from those and through this lenses we have profound transformations global transformations and I can only agree with Paolo and that we have to change or otherwise we will be changed and that said before the pandemic the the subject was more forest, less hunger, more nature, less hunger. That was the subject line till 2019. And we knew that 2020 would have a copy in which we would look for a global solution for the to reduce the world temperature because that was the most clear index that we were in a very deep transformation in nature that would affect human being and all the planet. And the pandemic showed very clearly that we, well, we left it more glo less globalized, more digitalized, poor, at the same time, poorer and richer. And the, the consequence of this was that Basically, in 2020, we had Glasgow, the COP26, in which these countries were getting ready to bring their goals. The European Union, which with 25 states, basically in Christmas of 2019, celebrated a deal, saying, well, I cannot have 20 alternatives if we are a union. Let's make a big effort to have one single global effort, and this global effort was reached. They brought the schools and negotiating very, very hard in a very hard well, way among themselves. So in the, the cultural diversity, they were able to reach that. So they released their Green Deal. And in this beginning, their goal was, it was the European Union goal with all its difficulties and a few moments later the European Union had the idea to in internationalize its Green Deal and then the big problems came in which we were affected as well. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. The Green Deal does not show, hasn't shown so far that they will open their agricultural market until 2000, uh, 2050. So the conditions to get to this uh, agreement and its goals, the condition was that the market, the agricultural market and the agro-industrial market would be the same that is closed. And this creates several conditions within the, in the European Union internal goals, closing several alternatives and several possibilities. And so the Green Deal was launched internationally. The Euro, um, Europe is inside um, uh, climate temp temperate climate area. And of course, our realities are very different. And in addition to that, the pandemic brought a disruption of productive chains not only related to ships, but also circumstances of need for global health. And each country took care of themselves in first place. So international solidarity regarding vaccines also showed that when a country is affected in its essentiality, they'll take care of their population. But there's another observation when developed countries had more vaccines than what they needed, the expectation of the other countries was that there was a distribution, a strong distribution, what did, in that, but that didn't happen. So 
the, the, the suspicion is that this global solidarity ha didn't show. It's a subject that in the subconscious of many people got very clear, and that's what Paulo said. Nearshoring was close because productive change had to be safer, not only in health, but also technology, uh, food supply chains, and raw materials. But when the then the Ukrainian war started, and then new criteria were set world wide friend and enemies and then a new priority order came up Europe then faced after 40 or 50 years this belligerent situation and then they have for themselves uh, a very delicate subject that was the energy area and then on the other side also the food productive chain and then the European Union had measures in which zero deforestation and the import of products with carbon started having their first international impact from the internal view of European Union process. United States acted very quickly and put in field a survey worldwide with stakeholders to understand where the countries were looking for contributions in the climate field. And this report was released in April. And the surprise was that the United States, in opposition to the European Union, um, Sorry, uh, coffee will be w with the coffee chain, soy with soy. I'm sorry, I need some water. And with that, the United States are opposed to the European Union to treat the subject. Thank you. I had, they say, I understand the problem. I understand that we need to do something, but let's talk to one another because I also produce soy. I also have corn. I want to talk to you to talk about the best methods and look for the indexes to decrease these or that about deforestation so they're in, a, in a different way. So of course, the developing countries, they have said, OK, that's important to talk, constructive talk, excellent, let's do that. China, on the other hand, keeps its opportunistic attitude when it's important for them. They do not have import problems about, for example, um, pork meat when they had diseases problems. But in other circumstances, suddenly they had environmental criteria. So China, who was um, a big consumer inside this scenario, puts their criteria in a very opportunistic manner. And then now, what Paulo also commented in the new BRICS, which is a, a kind of a new alliance. We knew that. We knew about BRICS with the four countries that not necessarily had uh, equal regimens, the same values, but they were together because they wanted to position themselves uh, about global trading and alliances. And with the new alliance, it's clear about the the Chinese hegemony in this field. China has created a very diplomatic work that we need to acknowledge. They silently reunited opponents, enemies. They reunited countries that they don't, do not have relationships with one another, and they built an alliance that's much bigger. And we can interpret that will take a long time to happen, that there are big differences, a series of things. But they'll sit in front of one another and talk to one another. And in Brazil, we can see in Latin America another th trend to compose this picture. Israel with the countries Abrahamic countries that like, builds a huge alliance and works this market subjects about uh, 
500 million people with countries that have the potential to a very strong capital potential in Israel with a, very, a huge intellectual capital, looking for people in Latin America, especially Brazil, because innovation in Israel do not have a lot of space to go forward, but a lot of space inside our continent. So if you look at this picture, you can say, well, so Brazil, where are we heading? In this circumstance, the first, well, the first thing to acknowledge, not only Brazil, but in Latin America. We are more and more a leader in the agricultural area and the industrial area as well as energy and we have a lot of environmental potential. This is an acknowledgement in a global way by all of these partners. If I am looking at a food issue, for example, I'm going to give you two numbers. So in terms of cereals around the world, a production of 3.2 trillion tons. 3.2 trillion tons and commercialized globally we're looking at 500 million okay it's 15 16 percent of the global production the biggest commercializer is Brazil with 20 percent of this 500 million and it's not corn it's not rice that in these 3 billion we have more than half it's with soy so something that was not commercialized normally in the world here Brazil is positioning itself in second place we have corn in Brazil and uh, we have really been breaking all of our expectations month of month month by month and everything points to the fact that we will be an international player in this area of course this starts causing some discomfort and it becomes an effect globally where there is a question, you know, where are you, Brazil? Where are you located? Are you in the Mercosur? Are you in BRICS? Are you with the Arab countries? Do you have an agreement with the European Union? You have a strong relationship with the US and the part of international trade. So how are you positioned? And so Brazil and here, I include the Mercosur, starts saying I'm in the production chain. I'm in the food chain, I'm in the chain that has to do with sustainability and environmental issues. I have something to offer to you. And that is where, looking at this morning's discussion table and another table on the bioeconomy, the bioeconomy is a long journey and we are already treading it. We are leaving the fossil economy to the bioeconomy and each one has its conditions. Okay, so in this huge field and uh, in this team, let's say we have these two boats that are leading us through this ocean. First, we have Europe, which is the biggest provider of concepts around the world and perhaps the biggest exporter of rules around the world and the U.S. as a power that says, wait a minute, I also exist and I'm strong, too and I have state policies. So in these two ships, let's say these vessels, they start to deal with a new element. Okay, so what is our currency here? Is it international trade? Somebody said, no, 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 wait a minute, I have a new currency. What is the new currency? Actually, it's carbon. And on the table, on the carbon table, we're going to start working on issues where the subsidies will be justified or where I am incentivating businesses to leave fossil fuels. And this table is already starting to be comprised. So where is Brazil? If we look at what is happening and what has happened over the past few days within the National Congress, it's concerning because it looks like we don't like this currency. This currency maybe is good for the European Union and the U.S., but perhaps not for us. 
and we have a lot of this currency to offer so we need to enter this playing field in a mature way we need to do this in a wise manner and we need to do it in an intelligent manner brazil has an identity of being united in its diversity there is no country so diverse and so united in its diversity as brazil and that is where we have our great power and our great fragility at the same time so my invitation today be at green rio is for us to be more and more united to join people's intelligence to join the institutions, both private and public, the families, so we can have this collective intelligence, which is what Paulo was speaking about way back when, saying we need to be a part of this transformation. And in this, Brazil has many possibilities, many chances to be a leader. The leadership of the G20 next year is ours and we will be leaders at the COP, we will be leaders at the BRICS and now Mercosur. So it's up to us, Brazil, not just to the President of the Republic, to bring forward this collective intelligence and to do our part and to make things happen. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I told you this is going to be a wonderful panel. I'm just delighted. Okay, I'm going to call my friend up now who is in Berlin but really wanted to participate. Marita, she is one of the first people that really spoke a lot about this concept of the Global South. Is she online? Okay, yes, it looks like she is great. Marita, welcome. Thank you, it's an honor to be here with you. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. It's a pleasure to hear you and see you. You look beautiful. All right, well, I'm gonna start in Portuguese and then my PowerPoint presentation will be in English, okay? Because I will be speaking about global issues so I decided to give my presentation in English so those who are not Brazilian can also understand me. Now, the subject... Well, the Rainforest Business School Network may seem small when we look at the big challenges and everything that has been mentioned here by Professor Paulo, but... Um, we do have to do with what he has mentioned about the importance of technology and also the Rainforest Business School Network has a lot to do with the true operational development of the environmental potential of the country which Ingo has mentioned now so I would like to Ask to have my PowerPoint up here. E eu vou passar para o inglês. Vocês podem projetar o meu PowerPoint, por favor. Muito bem, eu não estou conseguindo ver o PowerPoint, mas espero que esteja aí. E espero que esteja no modo de tela cheia. Muito bem, eu vou falar sobre o Rainforest Business School Network. E não vou falar só sobre o programa Amazônia 4.0, mas também sobre os nossos outros parceiros, CERT, Amazônia e Green Rio também. Muito obrigada, Bia, mais uma vez. Então, eu vou começar aqui com o contexto global. Eu não consigo ver a minha apresentação. É um pouco difícil para eu entender o que está acontecendo. Vocês poderiam me avisar se estão conseguindo ver a minha apresentação? Yes, we can see it, but we can't see you, ok? I'm going to talk to our technical team to see if we can fix this. Eu 
volto rápido. Right. Pode continuar, Marita. Okay. You may continue, Marita. Próximo slide, por favor. Muito bem. Vou começar aqui com o contexto global, porque estamos falando sobre isso, não é? Na educação, sobre as florestas tropicais. E uma das possibilidades nesse trabalho e no combate à perda da biodiversidade, no combate às mudanças climáticas. Claro que precisamos de verbas e recursos para isso, como o Ingo falou. E isso não é só na América Latina, na América Central e na Amazônia. Também estamos falando de outras regiões, a África, o Congo, a Bacia do Congo, o Sudeste Asiático. Então, às vezes falamos sobre o continente da floresta tropical. Imaginem como seria se juntássemos todas as florestas tropicais. Seria um continente maior que a Europa. O desafio que estamos querendo abordar com esse Rainforest Business School Network é pensar nos mercados e negócios baseados em ecossistemas que poderiam realmente agregar valor à floresta tropical e protegê-la. Nós estamos convencidos, bom, começamos na Universidade de São Paulo há muitos anos e há muitos anos também, claro, no estado da Amazonas temos o, a Escola de Negócios da Floresta e todos estamos convencidos de que a educação realmente é essencial para o desenvolvimento de negócios para a floresta. Então, precisam ser negócios baseados nesses ecossistemas únicos e essa é uma tarefa muito complexa. É uma tarefa também onde precisamos entender não só os ecossistemas, mas a biologia, nanotecnologias e opções relacionadas. Então, isso envolve várias descobertas. É como se estivéssemos explorando outro mundo, Marte, a Lua. Então, estamos falando sobre vários ecossistemas dentro da Amazônia. Isso envolve pessoas também, vários idiomas diferentes, tradições culturais e conhecimentos ancestrais sobre o que a floresta pode nos dar. Então, lembrem-se das crianças que se perderam na floresta colombiana que sobreviveram porque conheciam o ecossistema. Isso aconteceu há alguns meses atrás. Então, temos centenas de produtos já em cadeias de valor e acreditamos que poderíamos lançar vários através de pesquisas e pesquisas aplicadas. Então, precisamos pensar em mercados e indústrias que poderiam ser desenvolvidos e, claro, que precisamos ter a educação muito presente, considerando as características dos países, precisamos de marcos legais, marcos para o comércio e marcos para os setores diferentes. E claro que temos que tomar muito cuidado com essas salvaguardas culturais, ambientais e jurídicas. Então, é necessário termos uma nova disciplina na educação para isso. O Rainforest Business Education, essa educação para os negócios na floresta não é tradicional. Ela precisa alcançar produtores locais, comunidades cooperativas, pessoas que não tiveram acesso à educação e também aquelas pessoas que são muito qualificadas em termos de tecnologia, que têm uma formação internacional. Também precisa chegar às startups, pessoas do setor financeiro, mercados, indústrias, desenvolvedores de produtos, administradores. Precisamos pensar em sistemas de negócios que realmente podem, de uma maneira modular, 
serem, se articularem em várias demandas diferentes e cursos de especialização. Próximo slide, por favor. Próximo. Então, eu quero abordar essa pergunta. Por que essa rede dessa escola de negócios da floresta? Próximo. Pensamos que essa é a maneira de permitir um, algo... Opa, alguma coisa que eu é um negócio vibrante sustentável um negócio na floresta para alcançar públicos alvos regionais locais e globais como eu falei de forma rápida são os os pontos em parte da Amazônia que estão mais importantes a gente não quer chegar numa educação para negócios na floresta quando a floresta tiver se acabado já. A gente quer manter a floresta e até restaurá-la. A gente acredita que o network é colaboração para instituições, entre instituições de ensino e também provedores de cursos online de todos os tipos vão permitir uma aceleração maior. E próximo, por favor. Bom, nós recomendamos juntar é, competências existentes para acelerar um sistema de negócios na floresta colaborativo. Uma rede colaborativa, inteligente, pode otimizar o alcance, o conteúdo, o compartilhamento de aprendizado conforme os novos negócios vão se disseminando. E agora mesmo, enquanto a gente fala, como novas coisas são descobertas, novas demandas acontecem ali no, no mercado. Nós estabelecemos, esse ano mesmo, alguns meses atrás, o, a rede da escola, de, a rede Rainforest Business, e a gente já começou a convidar parceiros interessados para se juntarem a nós. E alguns de nós já estão. Já, já estavam conectados há um tempo. E o objetivo dessa rede é bom. Ela é uma iniciativa, como vocês já sabem, do Instituto Amazônia 4.0, do CERT, Jornada Amazônia, do Instituto CERT Amazônia e da Green Rio. O nosso objetivo, da, para a Amazônia especificamente, é organizar, facilitar, é, aconselhar, compartilhar conhecimento e experiências de campo. Isso é muito importante é, no no empreendedorismo de negócios na floresta, é, tem muita coisa que a gente pode aprender, a gente pode até às vezes a gente pode fazer mais, tem momentos que a gente pode, pode consegue muito mais é, com essas experiências e com o apoio de uma bioeconomia com o, o potencial único das florestas e dos recursos hídricos a Amazônia tem mais ou menos 20% dos recursos de água natural que circulam na Amazônia, isso é um recurso enorme. E não se trata só da floresta, se trata desses ecossistemas que, que não tem nada igual. Então, essa é uma lista bem longa, né? eu não vou ler tudo, mas a gente começou com o Rainforest Business como conceito e trabalhando no, no currículo em diversas instituições e claro é, foi no estado nas, na Universidade do Estado do Amazonas alguns anos atrás e a rede, a criação dessa rede para de fato acelerar e não só ter uma escola, só depois uma outra e depois só um curso. A gente decidiu que a gente queria ver uma transformação para uma bioeconomia na Amazônia e é, uma educação especializada é, seria totalmente necessária. 
E eu fico muito feliz de dizer que a Fundação Dom Cabral é parte disso e desenvolveu uma linha de bioeconomia, de estudo em bioeconomia, e a gente tem muito orgulho disso. Então, os objetivos colaborativos da rede são bem simples. A gente, junto é, a ao redor de todas as instituições, a gente quer colocar os elementos juntos para ter um currículo básico de negócios florestais que possa ser adaptados em diversas instituições de ensino e a gente quer acelerar o processo para ele alcançar muitas, muito mais pessoas em muito menos tempo com esse tipo de informação, dar acesso, principalmente em tempos de ensino online. É a oportunidade, tem que ser global, ela não é só na América Latina, ela tem um significado muito grande na África, no Sudeste da Ásia. E, claro, a gente quer criar sinergias, projetos que... Hum, sejam parecidos projetos que vão na mesma direção e cooperação e, e fazer um desenvolvimento de programas juntos para aumentar a sua eficiência é, próximo bom a, a rede Rainforest Business School vai eu também queria mencionar isso mas também não vou entrar em muitos detalhes ela vai funcionar é, na, numa base de uma é, no credenciamento quem entra na rede o que que essa pessoa tem a oferecer quais são as credenciais e quais são os sistemas que a gente pode compartilhar um, de sala de aula híbrido online e o que, que pode ser compartilhado em termos de facilitar a experiência de campo, de aprendizado em loco? Que tipo de serviços a gente pode desenvolver juntos? Como a gente pode criar um, uma direção através de várias iniciativas boas? E, por fim, é, eu queria agradecer muito a rede Rainforest Business School, a gente acredita que realmente pode fazer a diferença. Se muitos de vocês aqui nessa sala e todos os lugares participarem, e se vocês compartilharem a visão que a educação, é, edu educação baseada em ciência, e muito importante também, a educação baseada na tecnologia, vai fazer a diferença para a bioeconomia que é profissional, é competitiva, é tecnologia de ponta e, portanto, vai preservar a floresta. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much, Marita. Thank you so much, Marita. I know it's late there and you were kind enough to connect there where you are in your, in your apartment. Thank you so much. And I think that you, we, we must uh, continue with this, uh, this mosaic that you proposed with so many pieces, creating this beautiful design of this network. So congratulations, and let's move on. Thank you so much. And stay with us watching, please. And now I wanted to go move on with the, the rainforest uh, subject and now invite uh, Virgilio Viana now um, proposing him this subject and ask him if he agrees that rainforest, as they're being called in big Brazil, Indonesia, and Congo, are the new OPAP. Is it so? So let's hear what he thinks. Thank you, Bia. It's a pleasure to be here again with you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I was listening to Paulo's uh, lecture And I thought, I'm going to change everything that I'm going to say to interact. Because a lot of times we participate in, in tables and discussions, and each one of us tells their stories. But it's nice when we're able to interact a little bit. So I'm going to interact 
first with Paulo's talk, that, and he had a beautiful analysis, global analysis, and the perspective of the commodity scenario and um, the energy and alliance disputes, tensions, and the blocks, the existing blocks. And perhaps, Paulo, I think what we could add to your brilliant analysis is the dimension of climate change. Because the world is now living in addition to all that, the commodity war, ballot crisis, military crisis, the biggest of all crises that is climate change. And that's not catastrophism, this is science. And science, well, we do not have to craft a long list to identify the disasters that are higher in scale and frequency in Rio de Janeiro is the land of my friend Aspaza. Had several episodes. You can choose Petrópolis, Angra dos Reis. There was very uh, many, several episodes, uh, several tragic episodes. And this global equations is the climatic change equation. And in this context, we have to rethink geopolitics. And now I'm dialoguing with Ingo. Talk that the carbon change is is extremely strategic to the country and to Brazil to the planet and to Brazil because Brazil is the country that has the biggest potential of all countries to offer what we call nature-based solutions and it can be planting trees agriculture with more raw material in the soil organic material in the soil so this dimension it changes deeply global geopolitics and we cannot think about the world through a past lenses which was just market lenses commodities and balic risk i think the future lenses is the lenses of global climate change so my presentation and and i presented it at don, at don cabral and i'm happy to have been an accomplice of this alliance between don cabral and green rio and I, I think I was like the godfather, uh, the the best man of this marriage. Um, I think this dimension is. I think Green Rio has the opportunity to uh, make a relevant contribution to bring different perspective over all that, all that. And I think this. All and then, I bring Marita's uh, speech talking about education, and we work in the Amazon. I live in Manaus. I've lived there for several decades. And I think the, the education challenge is central. It's the most important thing. And now to dialogue with that, I think we need a deep revolution. Deep revolution in education to educate people for this new moment for climate change this new society that needs to be more resilient. First thing that here where we are, Marina Gloria, this beautiful place, there needs to be reset if the ocean goes up, and it probably will. There has been um, uh, the icing and the bit like the size of the Amazon, the state of Amazon, a million square Square kilometers. The state of Amazon, it's, I think, it's 30 times the state of Rio de Janeiro. So, 30 times the state of Rio de Janeiro, just to have an idea of scale. So, it's the context of Titanic. It's an emergency context, the global a context of global emergency. So, I think geopolitics was Brazil. In, in a very favorable position. I think that we have the potential not only in the carbon market, but also the soft power, just to use uh, this uh, English subject. My Marita spoke in English, so I'm going to use these expressions. I think this the great role of Brazil in international scenarios, not only as the supplier of soy or chicken or red meat, I think it's someone who was able to at the past convention is Rio 92 in which we were able we were able to reach so many things and when our president 
um, he brings many people in all countries in the world in Belém. I've been there a few weeks ago. And also in Belém, there will be a meeting for, uh, it will be a copy, a very important copy. And in the geopolitical global analysis, I think the big issue is called the climate issue. And the climate issue, Amazon ha the Amazon has an important role. Not only from the objective point of view, it has a, a, a very big volume of stock carbon and biomass, but a potential to the sequestration of carbon and also of another value. It's intangible the, to the imaginary. Why German German people are part of Green Rio are very connected to Amazon. It's part of the imaginary of Humboldt in the 19th century. It was part of literature, Englishmen, when Wallace, Spades, all of the big naturalists that came with their journeys, they put that in the imaginary. So Amazon has a value that's not only objective in the carbon point of view, biodiversity, water, and so many things that are obvious, but also has this imaginary dimension. So Brazil needs to be very smart about this. Instead of having a backwards stance, as we did in our recent past, where we were looking at the Amazon as something that w had to do with greed or something exploitative, we need to look more at this as an asset. We need to use this to bring money into our country so we can solve our big challenges and we are discussing in a very extensive way the dimension of green in the world and one of brazil's biggest challenges is to decontaminate its waters we will never be a prosperous country while guanabara bay is polluted or rodrigo de freitas lagoon or the chete river etc where is the funding for this going to come from? Brazil needs to be really smart. We need to be very intelligent to think about this in a sovereign way without being alienated from our national objectives. And the Amazon is an international asset, right? Most of it is in our territory, but it delivers services to the world and the world needs to somehow pay for the services it receives. Now, how do we do this? Are we going to implement fees, interest rates, credits through international organisms? Are we going to have concessionary resources, donations? Uh, is it going to be via the carbon market? How do we enter these international markets in a smart way? So I think we are going through an amazing moment in the Brazilian government and the stance of the Brazilian government right now is at the forefront. It is visionary. We are speaking about a new ecological transformation. This is not just what Marina said, it's what the Minister of the Economy said, what the Minister of Planning said. So we're living a very interesting moment and I think that today's Green Rio is totally different from last year's Green Rio. We are living a moment of hope right now and that is the narrative. Okay, so now we have the narrative, but what happens between the narrative and the execution, right? I have worked in the Ministry of Sustainable Development in the Amazon and of course we know there's a huge gap between these idea and the practice itself. But all of us as actors in society, be it in the sector of economy, the business world, the academic world that Paolo represents, we need to join forces in this movement so that this favorable context under a political perspective can become a real impact. So we are promoting this agenda in Fundação Dom Cabral. I am an associate professor there and we have different initiatives. So we're speaking about decontaminating Brazilian waters and BIA next year, I think we should have a specific session about this subject. How do we clean Brazil? We need to be 100% decontaminated. If we go to any European country, as Paulo was saying,
They have clean waters. You go to Munich, Oslo, any place in Europe, Portugal. The rivers are clean. We need to clean our rivers. So green goes way beyond the bioeconomy. Yes, the bioeconomy is relevant, obviously. But it is not the panacea. The panacea is the ecological transformation and that does, does not just involve decontamination, but processing solid waste, etc. And so I'm going to go through a couple of slides here so you can get a little taste of the Amazon. This is the pirarucu fish here in this slide. And we need to look at the world like those who are in nature look at it. I took this picture in 2014. We had the biggest rains of all time there. And the most vulnerable in climate change are the isolated Amazon communities, which are those that are the least involved in this problem, right? So this is an important concept that we need to look at. Climate injustice. This is the biggest climate injustice in the world with the Am with the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. And our challenge is to change this trajectory that has been caused by deforestation. We want the forest to be living. And the approach for this needs to be systemic. Okay, we can't just say, oh, it's going to be the bioeconomy, it's going to be solar power. No, it's everything. For us to move forward and be prosperous, we need to look at this in a bigger picture and see how we're going to join this beauty, the richness of the Yanomami, the culture of the indigenous peoples, these ancestral cultures with, let's say, the well-being of Sweden and Scandinavia where you have a low level of inequality, where women are respected, etc. So I'm not going to get into details about all of this, but this is kind of the uh, conceptual frame that we use as a reference. Okay, there's an article that I wrote about this in the Ipeya magazine. It's called Time of the World. And this strategy is very simple. Okay, we want, we know the forest is more valuable when it is living and we are working with the pirarucu fish it needs to be valuable to the fishermen communities they need to make more money we need to take care of people and we want to provide education to young people to women we want women entrepreneurs marita spoke about education and this is one of the nine mini universities that we built in the middle of the forest we need to engage people So the solution is not going to come from those who are in Germany or Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo or Belo Horizonte. It will be built with the local people who know where the alligator lays its eggs. And so we need to create these bridges between these ancestral, this ancestral knowledge and the technology of the future. And here we have some data. We can see we were able to increase the family income in all of these areas. We have different areas here. It's some hopeful data, okay? We have numbers about reducing deforestation in these areas where we work. And I just want to finish up because I want to respect the time. This is an image of the Jurua River. It's the most sinuous river in the world. And for us to exit Manaus and reach the last location at the end of this river, it takes us 15 whole days, okay? And this sinuous river, I think it illustrates the dimension of this journey, okay? Sometimes it seems like we're walking backwards, but we're just following the curves of the river. We're following its flow. And hopefully we can reach this horizon for a future. And the Pope Francis has also inspired us recently with what he has said. We do have reasons, okay, to be optimistic, but we have a moral obligation to be hopeful. We need to continue hoping. And I always see Green Rio as an opportunity for us to water this plant of hope. Thank you so much. Thank you, Virgilio. You really, your talk was really beautiful. 
And I think you were able to summarize a lot of what was said and you finished up brilliantly. And you have a friend in common, right? Uh, with some of our colleagues. I think you saw the Pope speaking this year and you received a medal of recognition, didn't you? And that is quite a beautiful message, isn't it? We do need to continue being hopeful. Hope needs to be present and listening to you all. You know, Paulo scared me with the scenarios that he mentioned to us. But he also gave me hope when he said that Brazil is the solution. And then Ingo and Marita also spoke about solutions for education. Virgilio now has kind of wrapped everything up very beautifully. And I hope we can continue this talk. So now I want to pass the floor to Henrique Garcilazo. Second year, he has honored us with his presence here in Rio and he will speak about his specialty which is the relationship between rural development and the climate and he is always speaking about how we need to create this urban rural connection and he keep please give us this global vision from the oecd obrigado bia peço desculpas por não estar falando em português eu preciso passar para o inglês é muito difícil falar aqui depois de uma pessoa que foi recebeu um prêmio do Papa e que falou sobre a esperança, não é? Eu acho que ele teria sido o fechamento perfeito. Agora eu vou ter que falar sobre desafios e tal, mas eu vou tentar ser positivo aqui também. Então, a minha fala hoje vai complementar o que já foi falado aqui anteriormente. E eu não sou um especialista sobre o Brasil ou o sul global, mas eu vou refletir sobre algumas das tendências globais e as suas influências em lugares diferentes, como o Rio, e entender o que, que impacto isso está tendo em geografias diferentes, porque muitas dessas tendências globais estão tendo impactos nas sociedades diferentes e re regiões pelo mundo. Mas antes de fazer isso, eu quero falar sobre a OCDE. Se vocês não conhecem a OCDE, eu vou apresentar um pouco a organização, depois eu vou falar sobre a globalização e essas mega tendências que estamos observando nos países diferentes, parceiros. E depois eu vou fazer 10 reflexões sobre políticas que poderiam ser aplicadas ao sul global e aos assuntos que estamos discutindo. Primeiramente, muitas pessoas acham que a OCDE é de países desenvolvidos, de primeiro mundo, que estão dando ordens em outros países, mas eu trabalho nessa organização há 18 anos e a organização já mudou muito ao longo do tempo. Antes éramos uma organização mais fechada, com 30 membros, quando eu comecei. E ao longo do tempo começamos a nos abrir para parceiros, novos membros. E ao longo dos últimos 18 anos, adicionamos oito novos membros, porque como organização percebemos que não seríamos relevantes globalmente se ficássemos fechados. Temos que nos engajar com discussões, trabalhar com novos membros. Então, muitas pessoas ainda pensam que somos fechados, mas não é mais assim. E também temos muitos comitês com especialistas, que trabalham sobre áreas diferentes de políticas. Temos agora cinco novos, me no novos membros que são muito relevantes para essa discussão hoje da Green Real, que estão nesse processo de aceitação. Um deles é o Brasil. O nosso comitê está monitorando esse processo. Alguns dos meus colegas vão estar envolvidos nesse processo diretamente. Espero que na próxima vez que eu voltar para cá, o Brasil realmente seja um membro completo reconhecido pela OCDE. Então, como trabalhamos? Nós não ficamos simplesmente em escritórios escrevendo relatórios. Estamos muito engajados com as comunidades. Fazemos algumas coisas diferentes. Trabalhamos primeiramente com dados, que são muito importantes. Trabalhamos com evidências. Precisamos de informações, é parte do nosso trabalho, não é? Para entendermos as tendências atuais, o que está acontecendo hoje em dia. E depois tentamos conectar as pessoas, desenvolver essa comunidade de práticas. 
e as, os comitês juntam países para discutirmos desafios, soluções, oportunidades e os relatórios que escrevemos, nós conversamos com pessoas sobre eles para entendermos os números, realmente somos uma organização que se aproxima das pessoas e de suas realidades, sim, então eu queria falar isso para vocês. Agora, em termos dos contextos que já discutimos, eu gostaria de falar sobre algumas questões diferentes. Primeiramente, tendências que estamos vendo em países da OCDE nos últimos 30, 40 anos. Estamos vendo uma diminuição da produtividade. Depois da Segunda Guerra, vimos esse crescimento de 2% da produtividade, essa tendência na produtividade. E agora, isso tem diminuído. Então, podemos ver isso e a ênfase da organização nos últimos 10 a 15 anos foi entender por quê, por que essa produtividade diminuiu. Os países estão investindo muito em inovação, tecnologia, capital humano. Alguns países chamam isso de o paradoxo da produtividade. Alguns anos atrás, o nosso departamento de economia fez um estudo muito grande é sobre 5 milhões de negócios e o que eles descobriram foi que a produtividade não está caindo em todos os negócios. Ah, os negócios de fronteira estão indo muito bem em produtividade. Tem poucas empresas que são as líderes, elas estão levando tudo. O problema é o resto, a produtividade e os ganhos da globalização, de ciência e conhecimentos não estão se propagando no ecossistema todo. Não é um problema de não, de não ter produtividade. É um problema de como integrar isso, de conectar, de garantir que algumas dessas tendências se propaguem em todas as empresas. E o que a gente vem percebendo no nosso trabalho é que essas tendências também estão acontecendo em diferentes territórios. Eu vou tentar focar... É, a gente, é um pouco, a gente viu isso em outras áreas que eu mencionei. É, tecnologia é um elemento chave e tem um efeito de bifurcação, vieses de habilidades. Isso vai criar diversas, muitas desigualdades, conforme a gente vai indo para frente também, crescimento populacional. É, para onde as pessoas vão se mudar cidades, essa tendência de urbanização e muitas pesquisas que mostram a imersão dessas mega cidades, megapolos com centenas de milhões de pessoas na Ásia, isso cria muitos desequilíbrios que, e, e desigualdades. E algumas das análises que fizemos mostram que membros, países da OCDE, a desigualdade ao longo, vem caindo ao longo dos últimos 20 anos. Esse é feito com países com menor PIB per capita, mas ao mesmo tempo a desigualdade nesses países também já vem aumentando. E quase todos os países membros da OCDE vêm se tornando, eles vêm ficando mais fragmentados. E quando a gente vê esse, bom, esse gráfico aqui não está aparecendo, então eu vou tentar mostrar o que, explicar o que, que ele quer dizer, é, a desigualdade tem muito a ver com grandes cidades e o resto dos territórios. É, isso é um problema. No, no passado, muitos responsáveis por políticas públicas dizem que é, cidades que a gente fala de benefícios de aglomeração, criam, criam ciência conhecimento e isso era um processo natural do desenvolvimento, mas o que a gente viu é que essas desigualdades se tornaram muito grandes ao longo dos períodos mais longos de tempo e criam muita instabilidade no sistema. A gente viu, por exemplo, na França, o movimento do é, é, polarização nos Estados Unidos, na Polônia, na Coreia, eles criaram um novo plano de desenvolvimento, o desenvolvimento é, a abordagem de desenvolvimento equilibrado para acabar com a super concentração de algumas dessas cidades. Então, agora, é, esse é um assunto muito importante de como tratar desses desequilíbrios. Então, porque não é um, um assunto só de justiça, mas também de instabilidade. Pode acabar com o sistema. E, então, um, um pouco o que a gente fez foi tentar entender quais são os fatores por trás dessas desigualdades. A gente já ouviu alguns deles, de, de, de alguns palestrantes aqui, e a gente tem as mega tendências, as mega tendências são essas forças que já estão acontecem a médio e longo prazo e vão formando a cidade, a sociedade a médio e longo prazo. Não só as sociedades, mas também as oportunidades e desafios. E o que a gente já ouviu sobre a digitalização, tecnologia, é, essa é uma 
é um elemento enorme, muito importante. A, a, a pandemia ela proporcionou outras novas formas de trabalho remoto, de uso de tecnologia e outra é a mudança demográfica, urbanização, outra é, claro, a mudança climática que a gente também já ouviu aqui e a globalização. Isso é algo que eu queria focar aqui um pouco. Se vocês olharem os padrões de urbanização, a gente pode ver que todos os membros, países membros da OCDE, todo mundo está se tornando mais urbanizado, exceto a Grécia. Mas também é verdade que é, localidades globais, fora de áreas metropolitanas, vem se tornando, vem envelhecendo. Muitos países têm, vão passando formas de, passando por formas de, de perda de população o Japão perdeu 40% da sua população em 30 anos a Coreia já também tem perdido a sua população o envelhecimento países do leste europeu também vem perdendo a população então como lidar com essas forças que a gente sabe que vão continuar dentro de 20, 30 anos e são muito importantes bom a segunda parte da digitalização, se a gente olhar aqui, por exemplo, banda, acesso à banda larga, as lacunas entre o urbano e o rural diminuíram muito ao longo dos últimos anos, todo mundo tem acesso à banda larga, mas se a gente focar na qualidade da banda larga, 30 mega, megabits por segundo, as lacunas são muito grandes e essa, esse cálculo de fato, países do G20, a gente vai ver que a diferença entre urbano e rural é de... De 52 a 54 pontos percentuais. A qualidade de banda larga, a gente ainda tem lacunas tremendas. Então, a gente está falando dos benefícios e potenciais da digitalização. Mas a gente tem lacunas que são completamente assimétricas ainda. E outro problema que a gente vê é não só na banda larga, mas as habilidades digitais. Aqui a gente vê que nem todos, todos os países estão preparados para tirar vantagem desses benefícios da globalização. Então, o próximo aqui é sobre globalização e o que a gente vê aqui é um trabalho enorme que a OCDE fez com a Organização Mundial do Comércio. No passado, os benefícios da globalização, o foco estava nas exportações e o que a gente fez, trabalhando com cadeias de, de valor global, foi tentar entender onde estava... Não era só onde o, o, o valor da exportação, mas o valor agregado nessas cadeias. Isso era fundamental e o que a gente viu foi que muitos lugares perderam. O que a gente ouviu um pouco também a competitividade de salários baixos, muitos dos lugares rurais. E a gente, por exemplo, no Brasil, a gente tem uma competição de muitos países que manejam mais o trabalho com salários baixos, mas o foco agora é, em agregar valor, entender onde a gente fica na cadeia de valor global e onde agregar valor nessa cadeia. E outra parte importante que, não foi, que já foi mencionada antes é a vulnerabilidade de lugares a globa choques globais. A gente já viu isso na pandemia. É, por mais que a gente tente criar alguns blocos na Europa, nos Estados Unidos, outras partes do mundo, todo mundo é muito vulnerável a esses choques. Eles se propagam isso gera muita discussão na Europa de, sobre reindustrialização, voltar em indústrias fundamentais para que os países não dependam tanto de outros. E também, outro, também sobre a mudança climática, eu, vou, eu preciso correr um pouco para não passar do meu tempo, é, o que eu falei para vocês é um cenário meio sombrio, globalização, mega tendências que criam muitos desafios. Então, o que os lugares devem fazer? Bom, primeira parte é prestar atenção às desigualdades, desigualdades espaciais para evitar a geografia do descontentamento, porque isso é um problema endêmico. Não acontece só com países desenvolvidos, mas também... É, no sul e a segunda parte que sabemos também para é, se referir a esses compensar os lugares não resolve precisamos dos, das ferramentas certas das condições de habilidades habilidades acessibilidade serviços de qualidade e aqui um ponto relacionado é que a gente fala muito sobre é não focar só no PIB mas pensar também em 
padrões de bem-estar. A gente está melhorando bem, os padrões de bem-estar nos lugares, sim ou não? O PIB tem muito problema, tem muita coisa a se resolver sobre, mas a gente precisa trabalhar com dado e falar sobre bem-estar. A terceira parte, se a gente pensar sobre desenvolvimento, o desenvolvimento não acontece com, só com o governo injetando dinheiro. Isso pode criar soluções temporárias, mas a gente tem que pensar com o desenvolvimento de baixo para cima. Como engajar, como mobilizar, como identificar alguns dos ativos que se tem na Amazônia, valores tradicionais, como pensar e colocar isso, abordagens de desenvolvimento de baixo para cima, engajar a comunidade desde o início. E a quarta parte é reter mais valor nos lugares. A gente trabalha isso em várias áreas. Isso é muito relevante também para a transição na mudança climática, onde os recursos estão sendo extraídos, como também melhorar as coisas, como agregar valor a esses lugares. E também já falei sobre é, focar em cadeia de valor e inovação. Também criadores de políticas públicas também falam muito sobre, e além de ciclos de cinco anos, criar políticas a longo prazo, cenários, pensar o que... Quais são as tecnologias que estão chegando em 30, 40 anos? Como se beneficiar delas? E pensar de forma antecipada e não reagir nesses cenários que estamos criando. Como esses cenários têm a ver com coisas que a gente pode medir e pensar. Também focar na escala certa. O que acontece quando a gente lida com muito desenvolvimento é que todo mundo quer um pedacinho. Lugares isolados, todo mundo quer seus ativos bem específicos, mas como pensar numa estratégia com uma escala geográfica correta, criando cenários para todo mundo. Então, pensem também em regiões funcionais, em lugares maiores. E pensamos também em soluções holísticas integradas. Temos que evitar pensar em soluções isoladas, aperta esse botão, vai funcionar. O desenvolvimento é meio confuso, a pensar em como diferentes políticas estão relacionadas, a inovação relacionada com o mercado de trabalho local, como negócios estão relacionados com determinados ativos, toda a integração, essas abordagens integradas são importantes e como engajar a universidade, o privado, o público, isso é muito importante. Precisamos de informação, de indicadores, precisamos saber quais são os lugares mais fortes, quais são os seus pontos fracos, identificar prioridades. São cenários que a gente sempre trabalha para tentar ter uma ideia de quais são os pontos fortes e fracos, e os dados são muito úteis. Agora a gente tem muito big data, tem muita informação que pode ser usada para a criação de políticas públicas, para entender o progresso ao longo do tempo, e também já estamos falando de oportunidades, transição para uma economia de baixo carbono. Eu estou passando um pouco do meu tempo. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigado. É, muita informação para a gente, muito dado. Acho que a gente... Acho... A gente ainda tem um, um, um palestrante que não chegou... Então, eu gostaria de fazer uma rodada sobre o que foi falado aqui e perguntar para o Ingo, ele anotou várias coisas aqui, talvez ele poderia ajudar é, com essa rodada aqui. Por favor, Ingo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bia. Um, so, this is a risk when we write down a lot of things. Yeah, I was, I was really taking a look at your notes, but I was, uh, I was embarrassed to ask you to read it. But it's a pleasure. It was a very... This is a very rich debate, and I'd like to, uh, about the, all the discussion here, I'd just like to stress some things that show a bit of the difference, the different views, and I think that we need to uh, learn from that. Enrique uh, put it very, very nicely, what OCD is, and he said, I'm a data fan, I'm a and we're data driven and this is where we point and he pointed to uh, the mega trends about urbanization in the world we have a uh, urbanization of uh, 60 percent and in brazil we're in 80 percent latin america as well and we point to 
in a very fast manner saying that urbanization we have big problems that we have nowadays in climate conditions and health, safety, and so on. So is that so? This is the first question that we have to pose. And then looking to Brazil, for example, Brazil now has 80% of their population <laughs> urban. Uh, above world average and we have incorporated a world trend and now we have urban pains and this is partly true 50 percent of this urban population lives in sm cities that are smaller than 400 inhabitants so if and he, if you look at a brazilian town that has less than 400,000 inhabitants this is very tied to agribusiness directly or indirectly so it's very different from a mega city that has over one million of inhabitants. So 50% of urban in smaller towns probably will have a different kind of approach, a different kind of thinking, a different kind of solution. We've had a surprise in their census, this year's census. First, because we do not have so many Brazilian citizens as we thought. We thought we had 2,020 million, and we have 2,008. But the most interesting thing was that in this demographic density, the index of human development in the states in which the expensive agriculture had its was most present, had the best growth indexes of uh, human development in Brazil, Goiás, Mato Grosso do Sul, the Minas Triangle, and so on. So we can learn from that. Uh, life, life in these communities. And then we see the index of unemployment, 3%, so full employment almost. And so this concept of urban is more expansive and we need to understand where we're heading. When we look at the inequalities that we talk about, yes, it's true. In Brazil, we have ha observed an increasing inequality over the past few years. We have, the rich have become richer and the poor have become poorer. So we need to address this somehow we cannot ignore this and we need to look at where the poorest people are and how this cycle of poverty is happening so this means very different solutions Vigilio commented this now speaking of the amazon where we have more than 30 million people right 40 million people so the solution to break this cycle of poverty is very different in the Amazon than it would be in the northeast of Brazil. It's very different from how it would work with communities in the mangroves. So we need to understand how this cycle positions itself in order to break it. And here in Brazil, you were speaking about data. We have some initiatives that actually were spoken about here even, where we can see a revolution of social technologies that are happening that are not in our radar. They are under our radar. So if you look at the IPTI's actions in the state of Sergipe, they have tech innovations in a very needy population that's very vulnerable and they are offering them amazing solutions and they're not in our radar when you speak about digitalization uh, yes initially i agree with you i'm going to give you another example and this is an example for us brazilians mato grosso do sul launched an initiative where it connected 79 municipalities and it will illuminate many different public squares with free 5G over five years. So imagine what this will happen in connecting these municipalities and the potential this has for security, health, and education. Imagine the businesses, if they're going to illuminate 120 public squares 
and give it 5G, this gives access to the local population. We know there are connectivity issues in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul. And this is a deep change. So when we look at big, big data top down, sometimes there are things happening under our radar that are amazing. And uh, another very relevant point that you mentioned about demography or demographics I have been observing closely the food production chains. If you look at the European Union, the average age of somebody in agriculture is 65 years old. In the US, it's 55 years old. In Brazil, it's 45 years old. When you enter the Matupiba region, it's 35 years old, the average age of a professional in agriculture. So those who are going to Matupiba, they have a cell phone in their hands, right? And how are they going to, or how is Europe going to compete if their average professional is 65 years old today? These digital technologies need a skill. So it's no good if we have an environment of skills, but we do not have the conditions and capacities due to, let's say, the age of these professionals. Or some people have these capacities, but they don't have access or conditions. Now, we need to think about added value. I agree completely. But we need to give access to this added value. If today I can only sell the coffee grains to uh, the European Union with these current challenges, I can't be competitive, right? So if I can see that the world is now becoming more and more closed, let's say, uh, where is my added value going to be used? Oh, maybe for decarbonization. Okay, it could be va valid for that. So I think that in this collective intelligence, we need to seek out some of our own things that we can show, prove, and share, not just internationally, but for ourselves, saying, okay, everybody, we have a lot of difficulties, a lot of things that are not good, but it's not that bad. And you know what, if it weren't that way, we wouldn't be for the fourth or fifth year in the row the fifth biggest port receiving international investments you know if we're screwing up that bad why are we the fifth biggest receiver of investments of foreign investments we needed to start looking at brazil in a, a more extensive manner. You know, Brazil is not that bad. I think we are a lot more beautiful than we imagine because we are being sought out, okay? I'm not speaking about, you know, modifying the numbers or anything like that. I'm saying that we need, yes, to face our huge problems. Yes, we have huge problems. And it's absurd that Brazil exports food and there's a issue with hunger here, this is not acceptable at all. And we can see that we have huge deficits in the poorest social classes, especially regarding the environmental transformation. So I want to thank Enrique Enrique for his observations because I think they really provoked this idea of a collective intelligence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingo. I think your comments were really important. And now I want to pass the floor again to Virgilio uh, because I think you addressed some issues that Virgilio spoke about. And I'm still thinking about climate injustice, you know? But I just uh, want to go back a second because you said in the next Green Rio, we need to speak about water, about the blue economy. Well, it's because you weren't here yesterday. Yesterday was the blue economy day for Green Rio. So maybe we need to think about carbon next year because the blue economy was already addressed. Green Rio is now basically green blue Rio. And now I think we need carbon. And maybe you can bring that in. 
anyway, having said that, I want to uh, pass the floor to you and then Paulo. So I think eu acho que o Henrique falou sobre muitos desafios e muitos dados na sua apresentação que foram muito importantes. Sorry, sorry, I didn't realize you were listening to the translation. Anyway, you shared so much information with us. You know, so I have some questions I want to ask here regarding what Ingo said. And I want to know how you perceive this solution for climate injustice, which is something so important. And then I will pass the floor back to Paulo so he can make some more comments, uh, speak a little bit more about why the solution has to do with Brazil, because I think we need to end in a hopeful note. Please, Virgilio. Well, this is such a rich conversation, such a rich panel. And uh, regarding what Ingo said uh, about these advancements in these territories where the agribusiness is present, like Matopiba, like the north of Bahia, the north of Minas. And so I want to make reference to what Paulo said when he was speaking about these three circles of things that are contradictory or that could create conflicts between themselves. So environmental objectives, social objectives. And uh, we need to look at things in a way under, let's say, a pink lens. You know, okay, Brazil's not that ugly, let's say, right? Considering what Darcy Ribeiro, our great reference, would say, he would say, Brazil is wonderful. It's a pity that it is unjust. That is really a pity. And the other pity is that we really destroy our heritage. And yes, the agribusiness today does generate riches, but the cost of this is poverty in the future, because if we look at this, the reality of many of the affluent of the San Francisco River, they are drying out because of the agricultural practices, because they use this water and they are entering, they are provoking a desertification process. So. We, of course, need to look at the positive aspects of Brazilian culture. Of course, they are relevant. But we can't just wear this pink lens and forget about what is happening. For example, we use an absurd amount of pesticides in Brazil. And there's no reason for this. We are poisoning ourselves with cancer-causing products. So yes, OK, we need to look at the positive aspects of the agribusiness, but also acknowledging that it needs to be transformed it needs to be changed deeply we need to look at how water is being used because it is not being used in the careful way that it should be the rivers are being destroyed in an extremely irresponsible manner okay i'm not being radical here but that is the truth of the facts so we have so many rivers drying out in Brazil. We can see this in different regions, in the São Francisco Valley. Uh, you know, and for the, because I live in the Amazon, this is the south of Brazil. So we see so many examples of this in the south of Brazil. We need to look at this. And uh, regarding climate injustice, Bia, I think that we need to look at this pact that was uh, launched this week, right, for the reduction of inequality as the big challenge we need to overcome. So we need to overcome this uh, global record that we have for inequality. I was just flying over the city of Salvador, and it's really impressive. The amount of shanty towns, of favelas that you see there, the amount of favelas in Rio, we have seen other countries conduct these transformations in their poor neighborhoods so that people can have well-being. We also need to deal with the peoples of the forest in a more ethical manner. 
it's really a shame how we have disrespected the indigenous peoples through mining, through deforestation. We need to look at all of this. And okay, I'm not saying we just need to be ashamed of this. Of course, yes, it's part of our story. And we have our wonderful things. We have the Christ Redeemer here in Rio. We have beautiful things. But yes, we need to acknowledge we have huge issues. We have big problems. Because if we don't, then it's like we're not looking at the deep transformations we need to conduct. And I think the agribusiness has this challenge in a way. Yes, it's important for Brazil's economy. But also, it can't just use up our natural resources. And I want to make special reference to Brazil's water resources that are being used in a irresponsible way. They are being polluted. And the cancer rate in Brazil, you know, we can see this, that it is not in acceptable parameters because of these practices. You have no idea of how you made this, um, this panel more spicy, you know, um, Ingo is the vice president, uh, vice president of um, of cell, and um, this this is very spicy. And we just need some caipirinha like, to make this a big conversation. I can get some if you want. Yeah, the spice was uh, was intentional. You know, at the afternoon, Friday afternoon, we need some spices in our acarajé. So, I love it. I love, I love it. And now I yield the floor to Ingo. I'll try to get the caipirinha. I don't know if I will, but maybe later we'll get some. Yeah, I'm always pro. Um, now I'm going to justify to him about the data we use in our assessments. European Union um, uses, for example, in the, their Green Deal, up to uh, 2030, 30, we we'll try to reduce the agricultural defensives. So at first we'll say, okay, great, 30 percent less of. I'll uh, try to use and um, to apply that. But if we have two or three harvests and each year, we'll have to use more defensives. So what's the fair indicator for the production of tons? And so how many kilograms of defensives will we use? Well, that will be a fair term. But internationally, w the measurement is made is made by through actors of land. So since we are more productive, we have to educate ourselves. And the second point is, certainly there are subjects in which we have a more, um, uh, the, the use of these defensives is higher than it should be. Uh, we saw that uh, last week in a, it, with producers that used they talked about the subject that for sure that happens but uh, more responsible producers they will not use more than they should so you can say well is this kind of defensive this kind of defensive is not appropriate okay this is a longer discussion it does it uh, is it pro it is it it generates cancer well this is a discussion and brazil is one of the leading users of bio products and the, the old uh, time DDTs and they're very reduced and the Brazilian technology has developed a series of topics for example uh, nitrogen um, captured in the land Brazil and in direct planting is the, le is the leading actor in the land plants that we use an institute of Kuhn that is promoting an integration between forests and plantations um, for creation of animals. It's a very good solution for intensive plantation. And this enhancement, yeah, for sure, we have to look. And through data, we have to look for that. And another example, since we're talking about 
agricultural defensives. Another, a big, the biggest indicator of the control over agricultural defensives is when returning your package. When you use a package of defensives, you have to return it. And we have almost 90% of in this index. And in the European Union, it doesn't, it barely gets to 60%. And people know their neighbors here. We have huge extensions of land. And it's an indicator, yes. Can we understand if we're using more or less through it? Yes. Can we do that? Yes, we can and we should. We have certifications. And I think the population, because of food health, they have the right and the duty to have this information. So it's a world that we have to work in this issue of um, uh, three harvests. I wrote it down and the San Francisco reduction, I'm going to um, go after it because our company has 130 years and works in re reforestation. We have more than 50% of our area that is preserved in native forests, Atlantic forest. And there is uh, this legend that eucalyptus consumes water and dries out rivers, which is not true because 130 years we've been planting a series of other things and it's completely the opposite. Is the half scientific information that we bring up the groundwater and when a vegetable goes grows very quickly, it absorbs CO2 and produces oxygen and it reduces heat. And we look at the fauna and the flora and we do not see difference so we have to base things in science and technology. Nina and I have been in Israel and, um, six weeks ago, and I found an eucalyptus this size, and I found it wonderful. I said, oh, we have eucalyptus here. I'm always fascinated by that. And they said, well, you know why? Because we planted in areas, in degraded areas, in uh, swamp areas and it brings water out of the, band, the swamp and I said it's not possible I never saw I've never seen an eucalyptus be alive in the swamp area I said it's fake and they said no I, we learned that in school and I said no come on look at that and and someone looked at Google it and they said yeah you're right it doesn't grow in the, in the swamp and that's why there's a big desert that so many so many eucalyptus they sucked out of the water but we need more and more data we need more and more certainty and I believe that the technologies we are implementing in Brazil and there are there worldwide we get there very quickly and the consumer will award the who's the best I think it's the best story we have okay thank you so much Ingo um, I don't know if the this um, neutralizes spice a little bit. I don't know if Virgil is satisfied, but out of everything I heard, I wanted to uh, note that some things get out of control a little bit. This panel was supposed to be a panel, South-South Corporation panel, and it's still that, but it got into uh, like that beautiful river that Virgilio said, it goes up and down. And I remember uh, like Gimaraj has a quote, the life gets hot and cold, gets tired, and asks us to be courageous. And I think we, that's why you're listening here. We need to be brave. As Gimaraj has said, we need basic sanitation. This is, if you want to talk about mentioning things, the, the floor is yours because we need the chance to hear a comment about Espaza. Uh, has an amazing book with Marcos Santa Rosa. I'll promote it. And uh, please, it's, uh, I think it will become a miniseries on Netflix someday because she talks about this saga, Brazil, the size it is can be half of it, cannot keep without basic sanitation. So Marita also, and Marita also mentioned education. But who's going to finish after uh, Ashpaza talks briefly? I will ask her. I need to finish with this guy here because he gave us 
a hint of hope in the end the river is going to make all its curves but the solution will come from this country here so you have this responsibility to talk about that and then just a quick word for us okay okay he will he will talk about okay since we have this metaphor of flavors um, I'm going to talk about sweetness I'm going to talk about what I talk about in my classroom they ask about the future of Brazil and I'll say well I'm very optimistic about the future of Brazil because I think Brazil will repeat in the 21st century as it did in the 20th century as being the country that most grew percentually when it gets to the 1900s and the Till now, Brazil was the country that grew the most. And 2000, 2021 hundreds, I think will be the same. And why do I think that Europe, United States, Japan, they were all developed. Now, the hard time, they do not have new territories to occupy. The population is getting old, as it was said several times. So what are the gains in productivity? Well, technology, but the 2% of growth, it's hard. Technology, technology is coming. It's going to solve a lot of problems, but they do not have new lands to occupy. They do not have new, do not have a new population to produce or to consume. So we have to look at the new emerging countries. So the first cut is the BRICS, but China and India have a problem: excessive population and lack of resources, lack of cultural resources. To keep growing, they'll need to undertake a colonial race as they are already undertaking the Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. And actually, when I showed the map of the world, the priority one, two, and three there, because the proximity. So it's inevitable for them to have this limitation of natural resources to be able to grow. And it's a military race. It's an economic race and a colonial race. They won't be able to grow as fast. Some authors, not most of them, but I'm among them, think that China specifically got to its peak. It's peak China, the term you can find on the internet. And now, okay, Russia and Brazil. Russia has a big territory, has natural resources, but doesn't have people. Russia's population is decreasing very quickly with the war in Ukraine. It's are decreasing even faster. I believe Russia will finish very tragically this war. Civil war is going to break down, I believe. And then there's Brazil. Brazil has the territory, has growing population, has natural resources to keep growing. And so Brazil, in the long run, there's only Brazil left. So out of the four breaks, the next three big emerging countries are Turkey, Indonesia, and Mexico. Turkey has the same problem. Its territory doesn't have a possibility of growth, and Indone population is shrinking. Indonesia has a big population, but three volcanic islands in a very complex geopolitical region between India and China. Several difficulties for keep growing. 300 million inhabitants, big population. Mexico okay, has potential. Mexico has territory to occupy. Population is growing, but a fourth of the size of Brazil. So what they can do is one fourth of what Brazil can do. And Mexico has got a lot of investment with NAFTA over the past 30 years, has developed the north fringe of Mexico, the Tex-Mex frontier, and has decreasing returns, and it's hard to develop Mexico as well. So out of the seven, is E7, the countries get smaller and smaller. The eighth is Saudi Arabia, which is a problem, depends, it relies on oil, it's either getting, it's either finishing or it's going to be replaced or both, and Saudi Arabia is going to collapse, and then the ninth is Iran, same problem. Excessive dependence on oil, and then when it's replaced or it's over, it'll get in the crisis. And the tenth is Poland. You saw the inequalities of Poland in Henrique's graphics, and it's next to Russia, which that also has several problems, doesn't have a lot of territory. The eleventh is Egypt also problems and so on, Thailand, Nigeria, Vietnam, the countries get smaller and smaller and you cannot find people that do not have problems. 
the next it's kind of without problems Argentina but but Argentina we know Argentina right they are sorry it's a tango so they have their internal problems but I'm very optimistic not just with Brazil but the Americas I believe this is going to be in the century of America is a new world in which there's land to be occupied, there's people to grow, and there are still natural resources we do not depend, we d and we are out of the conflict areas in the world. There will be war. It's inevitable. So in our time to fight for natural resources, humankind is going to fight. As Clausewitz says, war is a continuation of politics by other means. So when the diplomatic negotiation ends, people try to impose their will through military strength, creating a symmetry of power. It's beautiful, right? But it's basically beating up each other to force them to subjugate. So this is reality. It's been so for 2,500 years. So in practice, what's going to happen is Brazil is out of that. Not only Brazil, Argentina as well, Mexico as well. I think the whole America is going to be out. And that's what allowed the United Kingdom to become an hegemonic policy in the United States as well in the Second World War. The war is in order, and while it's not over, I'll sell it to one and the other. So I'm very optimistic about Brazil's long-term work. Brazil's not ready. We're occupying our territory. We're still working in the center, in the Amazon, in the northeast. The population is still growing. Brazil is the country of the future. This is a painful sentence for our years. You've heard it already. But when you look at mathematical models, the ones I have, I can show that Brazil is going to get ready by the end of our century. Okay, very quick calculation. So, if we look back at our independence, they made a calculation. Okay, how long will it take us to occupy this whole territory? And the calculation was seven generations, okay? So that's uh, 210 years. They thought that we would only have occupied our country around 2032, okay? Which is not here yet. And this story has changed for two reasons, because of the immigration in the end of the 19th century and the reduction of fertility in the 20th century. But yes, we are occupying our territory. So around 2050, our population will be of about 250 million inhabitants occupying the Brazilian territory. And this will happen throughout three phases that have happened throughout the history of the world. First, we occupy the lands, right? You have that Wild West phase where you have a lot of cheap and good land. And then, of course, this finishes. You start producing more in that land. You have the agribusiness stage, which is the one we are in now. But, of course, that ends as well because there's a point where there's n no more you can extract from that land. Then you have the third stage, which is aggregating value. You can see that in the history of France, Switzerland, Australia, all of the agricultural frontiers or countries that were agricultural frontiers, even Germany. So first you occupy lands. Then you produce in that lands. And then you in industrialize, you add value. I can't give examples, I think, because of our time, but, you know, you can look for articles I wrote about this subject and the history of Brazil, so I want to leave you here with our dessert, let's say. Brazil is going to be it for the 21st century, okay? Nobody's going to be able to run from Brazil. Now, I had promised that we would be conducting a comparison about what Brazil can plant, Africa can plant, etc. But our speaker who was going to talk about Africa had a personal issue and he will not be here to talk about Africa. So sometimes things go out of our control and we need to be able to improvise. Peter, I am owing you the Macauba. Peter is conducting work about the Macauba right now and about how it could be a shared culture between Brazil and Africa. I promise we're going to organize an event just about the Macauba. So I want to ask you all for five more minutes. Aspasia, please share your comments about what you thought of this discussion table because I could see your expressions when we were speaking and I think that our speakers deserve to hear your compliments. 
Well, you told me I could speak about sanitation, right? I'm not going to speak about sanitation because Brazil has many serious issues. One of them is sanitation, which has been a big mistake we made because we have advanced in so many ways since the empire. We were the third city in the world to have the best quality sanitation way back when. And then around 1940, we just stopped completely. We abandoned the sanitation because we were more concerned about energy, the industry, because we did not have a lot of money. And as Juscelino would say, when there are holes under the earth, nobody sees them. And the problem is not just sanitation. We're talking about education here. We cannot justify the tragedy that is the poor quality of education in Brazil. I try to explain it in so many ways. We had Nisio Teixeira, Paulo Freire, 100 years, exactly, we're almost at the 100 year mark in which Anisio formulated an educational policy that could be relevant today perfectly with modern education, a participative approach, and we stopped. So there is a serious problem with our political class. And I loved listening to Paulo, and I really want to be close to him, honestly, because I saw something very new in this discussion table today which is that for the first time I am listening to a geopolitical discussion involving the environmental issue. And Virgilio was wonderful because he complimented what was missing here, speaking about climate change also as a strategic factor, because here you all spoke about Dem the demographic explosion, about the aging of the population, about morphological problems. I'm a sociologist, and this was wonderful to listen to because people usually don't discuss this under the environmental lens. So I want to congratulate you for putting this discussion table together. Everybody said extraordinary things that I admired very much. I really liked what Enrique said because he spoke about subjects that are obsessions to me, like the regional issues. Brazil is huge, right? And Paulo was optimistic. I think he wanted to please us. But you know, we can't think that Brazil is not considered in the global map. I think everyone here was optimistic. Virgilio, and you know, I'm a patriot, I have to say. And because I am a patriot and I see the Brazilian political class as, let's say, the worst of the worst in terms of our qualifications, I am afraid because everything that is at stake today, and I agree that Brazil is going to be at the forefront, but we've already been saying this, that we were at the forefront and then we weren't. So we need to have strategies. I'm going to give you an example here before I finish up this issue of climate change. Of course, the environmental assets are in Brazil. Who's going to disagree with that? That Brazil is naturally the platform that is at the forefront. But the problem, we already know about this from coffee, from the past. We have the problem of the tradings, those that appropriate themselves of these natural resources to use them with added value for other purposes. So we already know about this. We know it well. And it is a problem because if we do not have this perception that we need to have business strategies that are very sophisticated and very mature, we will lose again because we will not have any control over the use of our natural assets and how they could be useful to other countries that control the financial system, capital, and who are, let's say, the owners of the world. These problems need to be very debated, and I just want to make quick mention here to inequality, which is something I have worked with for my whole life. You know, it's in my DNA. 
I have always wanted to face inequality and try and solve this problem. I was kind of born with this idea that we can solve the problem of inequality. So I want to challenge you all here by saying something very positive and objective. 80% of the inequalities that we have in Brazil are not purely social, they are regional because there is a lack of infrastructure and if the Amazon does not have the infrastructure that it needs to deal with uh, the residue of its products to commercialize its product, it will not be able to fulfill its role. So it's essential that we apply social morphology and federalism needs to work because the protagonism, the economic protagonism is not going to come from Brasilia it's going to come from the regions and the regions are the ones that will have to work on these different models these specific models so they can have a positive cycle of development and expand which is what we want so i just want to make this comment you know and I, I really want to highlight how important this debate is and I really want to be in touch with all of you because you all shared so much important knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Aspasia. I really wanted to get you up here because I knew you would share great comments. Thank you, everyone. If you want to have a caipirinha, I think we have some downstairs, all right? And let's move forward with courage. Let's always remember Guimarães Rosa's phrases. He speaks about how life demands courage from us. Thank you, and we will be here tomorrow. Bye-bye.